This is a demonstration on how to bind a pop-up book. And I've got several examples of pop-up books here uh, that show how the covers are done. And then I have a very large scale model of how it's put together and the kinds of details that are necessary in order to make a pop-up book open and close properly. As an example of a large or a thick pop-up book, I have a 10 Horse Farm by Robert Sabuda. And it is a book that is pretty thick. It's almost two inches thick, and it has a nice thick spine. The spine is, is that width. The spine is, in fact, the width of the pages all stacked together. You can see how bulky the pages are. Each one of these little pop-up pages is chock full of cool stuff that takes up a lot of room. And so uh, the necessary design was that you have a very big spine and uh, the two covers that are able to protect all of those pages without compressing them too far and without leaving them weak on the edge. So when this goes onto a bookshelf, it sits nice and straight and clean. The dimension of all of these elements in here is key to the design because it allows for a book to let open up completely flat, which I'll show you in just a minute. I also have a, a very tiny book. It's called Snow Days by Ernest Nestor. And uh, this book, it doesn't have any pop-up mechanisms, but it has what's called a blind or blinds where you can transform an image. And it still requires thickness in how the pages are built. There's a lot of, of uh, page material in there, so it takes up some space. So even though it has only a few pages, it's pretty thick. And as well as the, uh, the Ten Horse Farm book, it needs a spine and all of the structure to be designed so that the page is open flat. And then finally, I have an example of a homemade or handmade pop-up book cover with uh, some pages. The pages don't have any pop-ups in them, but conceptually, all of the features that are necessary in order to create a, a good bound book is done with this sample. The material that I have right here is a special material that's made for either uh, doing publications or, or even doing packaging and even book binding. And this stuff, I have a, a, a sample booklet of the company's materials. It's a company called Gain, and Gain makes a whole range of materials that are appropriate for this. Pellac is the one that we have. And so, you can see the samples and really cool colors. This is available from the GAIN website. You can actually order a sample like this and they'll give you all of these material samples. And you can see there's a wide range of colors and sort of textures here from these more subtle alligator-like patterns to more bold ones and then pretty beautiful colors and a third type of of design right here, a pattern that's a little bit more linear. And then there's the Summit version of these materials and the, the Kaivar 7 and the Silk Touch Nuba uh, and PLJ or PJL by Gain. These ones, they all have a similar material quality about them. They have different textures and different color schemes, but the material is a paper that has latex impressed upon it. And so these ones, the Pellac ones, are shiny, and that means that when the cover is on there, it keeps it clean. So that's why I like to use this particular material. But because all of these have that uh, same kind of coating on them, which is made with latex, they all can be durable and protect your books from, from scrapes and damages and dirt and all that kind of stuff. So here is some information if you'd like to see it. Gain Brothers and Lane, and it has uh, gainbrothers.com. So that's where you can go and look this up. Again, it's Gain Brothers and Pellac is the material that we're using. Here's an example of a book that was done with the Pellac Black that has a, the heavy sort of alligator pattern to it. And then I've got an orange color, which is really a beautiful color and also black, or sorry, a dark brown, yes. The dark brown is similar to the, uh, the same pattern as the orange, but it has that nice brown color. You can see the difference between the brown and the black. 
and then this this orange. So what a book like, looks like when it is bound with the black is this example. And then what it's like with the orange is this example, which is just a major, <laughs> gigantic example, just showing all of the details up close so it's easy to understand how they function. But that's what that cover material looks like. So the sample that I'm going to make today will be with the brown so that I have one of each. Okay, so I'm going to set these aside and show you some of the details of what makes a pop-up book open flat, and then I'll show you each of these opening flat as well. So this example is made out of foam core and some chunks of foam, thicker half-inch foam, you know, the kind that you'd use for insulation in a house. It's just a, a purple closed cell foam, rigid. And I made this because it's so bulky, but uh, still it functions to open up flat, which is the concept of how a pop-up book has to work. So you can see that there is a, an area called a hinge here. This is called the spine. It's the thing that protects the side of the, or the end of the book when it's on a shelf, and it also is where there's printing usually. But the stiffness of it is really hel helping define the book itself, making it clean, making it look nice from the end and also protecting it. So these pages in here, each one, there are six total, one, two, three, four, five, six pages, or six spreads, as it's called, are these two pages put together that makes one spread. This is the gutter that runs down the center of each page. So being made out of such a bulky material, uh, it, it reveals up close what happens with the hinge and the spine when a page like this is opened up. Because what has to happen with a pop-up book is that you have to end up with it laying flat so you can see the pop-up acting properly when it's flat. So take a look at what's happening here with the, with the hinge, the two hinges and the spine as I turn a page too. It's shifting over a bit, but it always allows for a a page to be open completely flat. So every page can do that. If you start from this page and you work through, you can see that this is laid flat. This one is flat as well. All six pages will do that and the hinge has to work accordingly in order to make it function. When it's in the middle, it's the most even and you can see that if you were to add up everything that you would have a a closing up space here and then you add this hinge and that hinge to it and it makes up the spine width. So to reiterate that you have a hinge here, you have a gap and then you have another hinge and all of those make up the width of the spine. The spine is the width of all of the pages put together in their most flat uh, arrangement, not the most compact, not the squeezed down arrangement, and not when they're all bulky and propped up, but when they're flat, combined with the thickness of the two covers, the front and back covers. So front, back, and six pages all together make up the width of this book, and then the spine is matching that. Okay, so I'm going to show the same kind of ideas on these published books, these printed books, and you can see that the same thing applies. You've got here the spine, which makes up the width of the book at its bulkiest, and then you have the two hinges, and you can see that if I flex this, the hinges are flexible, and I can open up a page and it will lay flat. So that's the idea, that that hinge is flexible, and will allow the pages to open flat. A normal book doesn't do that. So every page is allowed to open flat, even on this miniature one. And you can see that. It's the same with the case of this handmade one. It has the hinges being made just simply out of that gain pellac material. And the page opens completely flat. And each page can do the same. So watch how this gap down here changes as I open up a page. So right now, they're essentially touching each other, the pages. There's room for flex, it's flexing, 
and then they touch each other again. So down in here, that gap shifts and changes as I open the page, and that flexibility allows the pages to lay completely flat. Every page works that way all the way through the book. And then this extra thick one, same thing applies. So as I'm opening it up, these amazing pop-ups have all of the power they need because the, uh, the gutter is, being in the center is opening up all the way and the pages or these, the spread lays flat so these horses can come out very beautifully because it needs that kind of power and that kind of completedness for opening up for all of these pages to function properly. Notice as I'm doing this, look again at the spine here. You can see the spine is very bulky, or you know, very wide, and the hinges are flexible and they're pretty wide in here, as far as like how long you know they, they have a good width across here, and all of the pages have these such uh, a huge amount of material in there that they really don't closed flat at the end. In fact, if I squeeze this really hard, you can see that's what it would be look like. It look, look like if I had squeezed all of the material air out of the space, it closes the book up a lot. But that's not the way the book really should lay because it's in the middle, it can't be compressed that way. So that's why it's so wide. But pay attention to the sort of corrugated design that's happening down in this area here. It looks like they go zigzag, 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 and there's open spaces between each of the pages uh, down in the gutter in between, in between the pages. And that in between area on each one of these things is actually a leaf. So, so this is a leaf on a page. It's a single, or in a book, this is a leaf. It's a single unit. And in a normal book, that's one single piece of paper. But in a pop-up book, it's actually two with an open space between them. And that allows for this to be not only stiff, but it also allows all of the design elements to be done on one side of a sheet of paper rather than on the other side as well. And then they're just glued together or bound together in some way, including double-sided tape, all sorts of processes can be used. And in fact, some books, uh, they don't even have uh, to be joined like this because they're made out of one gigantic corrugated arrangement of all the pages in a row, and then they just get folded into place. But the, uh, the design of a pop-up book means that it's bulky and needs to have special consideration for all of these little flexible areas down inside of here. So you can see that if I took this uh, tool, I can put it right between pages and it doesn't uh, open them or tear them because they're attached a little bit further back. They're not attached at the spine area. Okay, so that kind of design element is very critical in making a pop-up work. So as you can see here, the same thing applies. Each one of these page units is really thick, but there's this little curve element down at the bottom right here, and there's another one there, another one there. Those little curve elements are uh, not glued or solid down at the bottom. They're glued further up to each other. Okay, so I'm going to set all these aside and then get some materials out for a book that I'm working on. Now this pop-up book example is like the other one that I had made that has the black cover material on it. It doesn't actually have any pop-ups in it, but conceptually it's going to be as though it did have pop-ups in it. So what I've got as some materials to be able to build this, put this together, are six pages, six spreads that is and each spread is folded and this is the width of a single page and the double width of the page is a spread that is the open book and the closed book so i've got several different ways of putting these together to show you the differences not that you do a book in two different ways like i'm going to show you but it shows you two different arrangements for how, how you can sort of set up your, your pages or your spreads so that they can be assembled in a way that is secure and nice. So this page here and this page here and the third one are all just single spread elements that can all be put together. Then I've got one that has an extra glue tab on the edge. I've got three of those in fact. 
because this is how you assemble a book that needs to have space in between the leaf in order to allow for mechanisms, say, say you have pivots and all sorts of things that need to go inside in between the leaf. If you recall what I said about the, the 10 horse farm book down in here, these pages have space between them. So there's open space between each leaf. A normal leaf, like in a normal book, like I said, is only just a single piece of paper, but here they actually open up to form a space between them. That space is where you put mechanisms that sometimes need to be done. I have an example of a book that does have a lot of mechanical elements in it. It's called Knick-Knack Nick Paddywhack. And this book here um, <clears throat> It's by Paul Lezinski, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite an amazing, insane amount of mechanisms inside this book. Now, I bought the book Damaged because it was the only one that the, the bookstore had, and so it, I can't make it function, but I will be able to show you how it works because it was falling apart when I got it. So I'm going to give you an example of, of what is meant when I say that the leaf contains mechanisms in it. So here's a page, and this is the spread, but this page here and the other side make up a leaf. And of course this is another spread. But the leaf is actually made out of two pieces. So I'm opening it up. You can see that on the inside are a lot of mechanisms. Things that slide and are activated by pull tabs and whatever like pulling or moving mechanisms you can design into this so I can't quite get at one but you can see how much material is going on here and how much material is going on over here then there is this slip sheet it's an extra piece that's inside between the two mechanisms sets of mechanisms to protect them so they won't get caught against each other so that is all inside of the spread, or inside of the leaf. This type of design is why I've made this extra little glue tab on here, and you can see that that is exactly what is going on with this page. This is an extra glue tab that actually is supposed to attach to this page that fell out of the book. Now, what happened was I was over at the bookstore and kids got to this book before I did and they destroyed it, so I didn't even get it at a discount. Okay, so again, this will allow me to glue another page to it and have it springy and leave it open between the leaf. So I've got three of those as well. There's another one and then the third one. So my first problem is not to even design the cover material yet or put any of that together. I need to assemble all of my spreads into one compact unit to make them like, uh, like they are in my sample here. A full set of grouped pages or each spread as its own unit grouped into these uh, leaves or leafs that are put together into one unit and the and you will see that I'm able to actually spread these apart just like on any of the other books that I've shown you uh, there it should be if I can get in there I should be able to get my finger down between some of these pages there I go okay so you can see that I can hide tools in there inside of a leaf. Now, you notice that there's not much room here. If I'm trying to get this tool to slide back and forth, you can see that it only goes so far towards the front and it only goes so far towards the back. And that's because the, the leaf is glued right across here. That's what ties the two together. And then at the back, they're also glued, but not all the way to the back. Like I said before, there's a gap right here so that there's flexibility and the reason for that flexibility is to allow the
the pages not to be squished flat at the at the spine and if if I did squish it flat the book would be very thin and of course this book has no mechanisms in it but I designed the cover and everything as though it did have bulky mechanisms and that's exactly what I'm gonna do with this okay so <clears throat> when you are assembling one spread to another what you have to absolutely make sure happens is that the gutter or in this case it would be where the spine is the gutter of your page when it's folded up is where the spine is is lined up really well with the next page's spine it doesn't matter if the bottoms aren't perfect it doesn't matter if the sides are perfect or the top is perfect it really does matter that this spine is aligned properly as you can see with my gigantic model all of those spines are lined up nicely and or each of the the gutters and, and the spine of every page is lined up nicely so that the spine of the book can actually just lay flat against it when a book is put together without that spine being or when all the the pages spines are not in alignment the book doesn't want to open properly and sometimes it can even just jam at kind of a weird angle and not lay flat Okay, so how do I glue these together? And I think I better start with one of these that has this extra glue tab, show you how I can join it to another one. I'm gonna fold this up, increase it, get it nice and stable. And by the way, this piece right here is the cover material. This is just Crescent Matte Board or Crescent uh, Cardboard Company's uh, matte board and it could be illustration board, it could be cardboard, but closed cardboard, you know, solid cardboard, not anything that has a corrugation to it, just something stiff. This particular material is um, about a sixteenth of an inch thick, and it also would relate to about one and a half millimeters for people doing metric. So about one and a half millimeters, one sixteenth of an inch. But it could be thicker. I wouldn't go much thinner, but that's it can be thicker than that too. So I'll set that aside. All right, so I'm going to apply glue to this tab. And then that tab will join to another page here. Get another one with a tab somewhere in here. Get all those three together. This tab. Okay, so what's gonna happen is this tab on the first page is going to join to the untabbed next page. And the goal is that the pages sit flush against the table here and then I know that both of their spines will be in alignment with each other so I've got to get those to attach properly so I'm gonna apply glue here only then stand it up and get them to align just right and press it together then I will be applying glue down at the bottom of this within the gap here, and it's a very special kind of arrangement I'm gonna do there too, where I only glue it in one spot up here and one spot down there. There's no need to glue the entire length, and there's no need to even glue the sides of any of this. All right, so applying glue. Now I have three different kinds of glue and then another material, a tape dispenser that is gonna allow me to put this together. I could use any one of these and they will all work for being able to join the pages together. So there's some double-sided adhesive or tape. And this right here is a nice Scotch ATG or automatic tape gun 700. And this one is used for matte protection. This is an archival uh, adhesive double-sided tape. Um, it's the kind that doesn't leave any uh, paper or anything and only leaves the adhesive. So this is something that I use when I'm doing matting and framing, so it's perfectly fine for doing this kind of, of art preservation. The material here is by Linco, and this is a, a, a nat natural pH neutral um, PVA glue. So PVA, polyvinyl acetate, is essentially what's in Elmer's glue too, but this is one that is considered archival and it lists right on here it's good for paper, board, framing, collage, crafts, and book binding. So this one will not deteriorate your items. It will make your work last forever. This right here is Bristol, which is also archival or pH neutral. And so this will maintain its whiteness for decades or centuries. And finally, I've got something called Yes Paste. 
Yes, paste is acid-free, pH neutral. It is one that is used for binding and for artwork and for all sorts of uh, crafting and scrapbooking, but also it's perfectly fine for putting this book together as well. It's a paste, and so it's not like the other glues that I have. It's thick and sort of waxy looking, and the only way to really put it on is with a spreader. So I have a spreader available too. And that spreader is one that I have around, but most of the time when I'm doing this kind of thing, I don't use a spreader. I just use a piece of scrap mat board as the spreader. So if I have my piece of mat board that's gonna be used, I make sure I have a little bit more than I need, the cutoff becomes the spreader. So you don't need anything special for that. Okay, so this first one, I'm just gonna use Elmer's glue wall. Now the glue wall is not school glue, it is glue wall. Glue wall will be very, very strong. It bonds permanently, it dries clear. If you use school glue, you're making a mistake because your pages will fall apart when it gets humid outside. All right, so I'm gonna apply glue here and in order to protect my space, I'm gonna get a scrap piece of paper that I can tuck in here and then I can spread the glue without worrying about getting it all over anything. And I'm just going to spread this with my fingers. Now it would be better if I didn't have white on white, but that's the way it is. And I will spread this nice and evenly everywhere. Typical of making all of these pop-up mechanisms is to really spread your glue nice and evenly everywhere. Make sure you have enough and that's not too wet. It needs to be wet enough that it is tacky and will bond well, but not so wet that it will wrinkle the paper or make it so that the ad adhesion is taking too long. Because it's possible to have things start slip up, slipping apart if you have too much glue on there. Okay, so now this is a critical stage here and I've got to work fairly quickly. I'm going to take the page two and page one, make sure that they're, they are lined up to each other on the table and lined up to each other front or top to bottom, I should say, and then just gently press that together because now I can lay it flat and smooth this out. So what it should look like is that they are nice and even across the spine area. So I'm gonna make sure that's really laid down flat. I'm gonna open it up and see what I have, have made and really get that to be pressed on there nicely. And what you can see is that I've got these aligned well across here. They're lined up really good. And I have now made a big double spread. This is how a lot of publications have their books made. Like I said before, the Paddywhack book is like that. If I open it up, you can see, because it's falling apart, I can do this. It just is one gigantic corrugated set of pages all pre-joined together that all fold and join. And you can see that there was glue on here. They didn't put much on, but that's the way it goes. And then there were little dabs of glue in various places to close this all up. All of that has come apart. But that is essentially what's going on here because I've joined them all together. This allows me to put this together and leave a very nice flexible space between. I'm gonna pinch it at the spine area and show you that I can drop a tool inside of there. You can see that this can go all the way to the front and it can go back. That allows for mechanisms to move freely inside of there by not having it glued solidly, like if I pinch it here, glued solidly. Okay, so I'm gonna attach my second one, or my third page. I've got this hinge, this glue hinge, and then I'm gonna attach another one that has a glue hinge on it, right there, and attach it there. So this time, I'll use the pH neutral Linco stuff. Oh, geez, that's a mistake. Icky. I think I haven't shaken it up for a couple weeks. Actually, I have to be honest, I haven't shaken that up for about 10 years. So I'm gonna wipe this stuff off. That's just disgusting. Doesn't smell that good either. 
Okay, Linko, you're out of here. I was going to use you. Maybe it needs to be really shaken up. I don't know. It's been sitting around for a long, long time. Luckily, I haven't had to do a lot of mat cutting and matting and framing for quite a while. I'll shake it up, see if it still works. In the meantime, though, I'm going to use my ATG instead. I'll show you how that works. So, uh, as a test, I'm just going to take a scrap piece of paper here and I'm going to press the trigger down, put the wheel here, press the trigger down and pull, and it dispenses tape, the sticky part. You see, can you see that sticky part right there? Yeah, it shows up. And if I fold this over like that, it's now permanently attached. Doesn't require any set time. I can fold this over, it's now permanently attached as a unit. So that is how this tool works. So all I have to do is run it across here. This is the scary part though, because I can run it across here and if I misalign this next page to it at all, too late, you can't take it apart. But it sure does speed up the process of actually putting things together. So here it goes. I just release the trigger and pull, and the tape has been dispensed, and you can see it's dispensed onto my fingers. Okay, so carefully I've got to get these things lined up. So I'm going to do the same way I did before. All of these are on the table, nice and flat, making sure the ends are matching. And then I'm going to get this to tuck in. And like I said before, once it's connected, it's too late. That's now on there. So look what I've made. I've made a, a set of three spreads now that are joined. One, two, three. And all three corrugate to form the, the book as it's coming along. And all the spine elements are fairly lined up. Not perfect, but they are okay. Okay, so I better try this Linko stuff again. Really shake it up again. I'll see if it will actually dispense onto a scrap piece of paper. This time I'm not going to put it over the page that I'm working on. Let's see how it goes. Ah, that looks more like it's supposed to. It looks more runny. You can see that. Spreads okay. Smells good. It smells like kind of minty, like that childhood glue. Mmm, that smells good. Okay, so I'm gonna put that on here. And it's so runny, I'm gonna not even lay this down. I'm gonna put it on here up in the air instead. Apply some here. Rub it with my finger. Like I was saying, this is a this is a expensive glue, but it's it's an archival glue, which is allowing you to make artwork, which you know you can sell it and you can have it in museums and all that, and it will survive. It will stand the test of time. Now I called up uh, Elmer's about their glue wall because I needed some specs on it for a project I was working on things that aren't listed on the bottle and aren't listed in any kind of publication, and they said that that is also considered acid-free. So that's a nice thing. But it's not expensive. It's made for kids and for adults. So there I've got the next one attached using this material. And it looks like I've got it slightly out of alignment, which is it's good because I can take this off and get it aligned right which I couldn't do with the tape. If it was a tape, it would be a one-shot deal. Okay, so now I've got it aligned better. And I, I'm gonna open it up and spread that better out in the air. Okay, so now I've got four out of six of these spreads put together. So my next one 
it doesn't have those fancy extra, well actually the one I just put on didn't have it on it either. It didn't have the fancy extra glue tab on there. I did this on purpose just to show you the difference between the two. Not to say there's one way that needs to be done versus the other, except that if you need to have that gap in here for mechanical elements to move around inside the pages, then I would definitely put that extra glue uh, tab on there so that you can actually get it put together and leave flexibility. Otherwise, you don't need to. So, given that the next two don't have any of those extra tabs on it, what I'm going to do is just put a, a bit of glue across this edge, make sure it spreads out to the edge, and then attach. And you'll see how it'll act differently. So, um, I'm going to do this one with this Linko material again, and then the very last one I'll just do with Yes Pay so we can try them all out. Okay. Apply a little bit of glue here. And you can see there is glue laid out there. And spreading it out towards the outside of the page. And the reason I do that is because I want to make it so that there isn't any gap where the pages are uh, in contact with your hand when you open it. So it's the glue goes all the way up to the edge. It's not the full thing that's being glued, it's just that edge. So I've got to stack these up carefully. Make sure all those spines are aligned and press that together. And now I'm going to open this like the others and you can see it doesn't have the ability to lay out flat anymore. So I've got to be careful of that. So let's see. I'll put one more on and then we'll see how this all behaves now that I've got several of them glued without having that extra flap of uh, a hinge on it and then some that do. So my last one has to be glued the same way. I apply glue to this edge and then I put these together. So I'm going to try the Yes paste. It doesn't smell like anything. Okay, so I'm going to use my spreader. Actually, you know what? Instead of that spreader, I need something smaller. So I'm going to hopefully find a piece of cardboard or something that is stiff enough for this. And if I don't, I'll use this. So I'm just going to use this. So I'm going to scoop some of this out and you can see that it is a thick paste, wax-like material. If it's too thick, you can actually thin it down with water. Um, they do warn you, at least they did when I was a student 30-something years ago, that if you do that, your water may make it not archival anymore if your water has problems. So they can't guarantee that if you add water to it that it would actually be archival. But if you use distilled water, it's going to be. Okay, so I'm going to spread some of this paste on here. It's really quite a different experience to use Yes Paste. Spreading it nice and evenly. I definitely needed that extra protection paper here, otherwise I'd be in trouble. Yes Paste tacks up fairly quickly, so you don't have a huge amount of time to work. I set that aside, and you can see that had I not used this, that glue right there on that edge would have ended up on my workbench. So there's a shiny little section there, that's where it's wet. Okay, my last one together. One of the huge mistakes that you could make at this stage as I'm working this is that you glue the pages in the wrong order. That would be a bad deal. Luckily mine's a totally blank book and it doesn't matter. So Yes Paste is being used for this last section and I need to make sure that it really is laid down flat. So I'm going to keep pressing that a bit, make sure it's smooth. And then we're going to examine how this thing opens up now that I've got those splotches on there. And I'm going to get this excess Yes Paste off of here. And this is definitely feeling the stickiest out of all the glues that I've used. I was able to use the Elmer's glue wall and just wipe it off my fingers. I was able to use the Linko material glue and it just wiped off my fingers nicely too, but this stuff is pretty sticky. The tape, obviously, you know, from the ATG gun, that was super tacky, 
but it didn't just stick all over my fingers like right now I feel tacky stuff on my fingers. Okay, so I've got that cleaned off and I'm gonna use a little bit of water to get my hands wiped off. It's good to keep a little bit of water around just for this kind of task. Okay. My hands feel better. They're not sticky anymore. And let's see. Now, the only thing that is 100% bound now is the tape, because the tape, once you put it together, it's done. But the other things do take time to actually set. Um, there's a drying and then there's a setting for glue. And um, you do not have to wait very long, but they're not really bound completely. It takes, takes a while for glue to actually set, but that doesn't matter. Um, you wouldn't want to handle something 100% until it really has set, and that means like a day. All right, so you can see that the corrugation is working here wherever the page was done with a tab to glue them together, and you can see that tab, remember? But as I get over here, they don't work that way anymore. These don't lay flat. I can't lay it flat over here, and that's because I glued them. So now if I was to assemble the book the way I've got it now, each page opens up nice and flat like it should, each page works well, lays flat, it would be a mistake because I haven't connected the spine element together yet, and it's possible to have a book open up like this, and then suddenly fall out of your, your, your book cover if you don't have these joined in these in-between spaces. So if I, if I show you what this looks like, there's a spine. You can see that they look nice. They are springy. They have room. They're an accordion. And if I just left this loosely sort of packed, it wants to be about right there. That's as though I have a bunch of bulk in between my pages. The pages open up okay, but they are an accordion. And so I want to maintain that accordion kind of design here by putting glue about half an inch or so in instead of right on the edge of the spine, I'm putting it in from it. That's unique to a pop-up book. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna get a pen here and show you what I'm doing. In order to do this, I'm gonna use, uh, I'll just use Elmer's glue because it's in a tiny bottle and easy to get to. The idea is that I'm applying glue here and here on every page. And it's closing up the leaf area of two halves of pages that are put together to form the leaf. That's where the glue goes and here. And all of those spots should allow me to make a nice, flexible, easy to open set of pages that also leave the, the appropriate amount of space here. So I'm starting with the bottom. Just a little dab of glue. And I don't need to put much work into this, just a little dab here, a little dab there. Spread it out a bit so it doesn't wrinkle too badly. And then just press this down and go to the next one. I can do all these pretty fast. Now, it would work equally well to use any of the other adhesion methods, including the double-sided tape. Just a little, in fact, I'll do that for this one. A little bit of double-sided tape, release, press, release, close it up. Okay, and just for fun, I'll use the Linco stuff now. Little dab here. That was so much of a dab. This is the most fluid of all of these materials, so it's much more wet and flowy than the Elmer's is. Press that down, and we have one more to do. This I could do with yes paste, but you know, I'm just gonna go for Elmer's. What I'm not using is tacky glue, and I'm also not using uh, epoxies or anything like that, and I don't need to. Elmer's glue works perfectly well for all of this. Now, you could use rubber cement if you are so inclined, but I find it to be so 
messy, but on the, at the same time, it is like the double-sided tape. It's basically like putting the adhesive material from a double-sided tape gun, but with liquid. And then when it sets, you can press the two parts together and it's bound or it's stuck together. So you can see now these are all held together and springy. So if I only hold the front of the book, the front edges, you can see that those are all held together on their own inside where those little dots were down in there. Okay, so now this is a book that won't fall apart when I open it. It behaves like it's supposed to. It behaves like a book. Each page opens up really nice and flat. So take a look at this. As I open these, watch what happens. So you can see that this is the front of the book. This is the spine. As I open this, take a look at the spine and watch what happens with the pages. Right now, if I were to take a measurement and say, how far is this page from that page on the end? That's probably about, you know, three centimeters, maybe an inch or something. And if I take half of this, or you know, there's six pages, so I should be able to take three and three. Uh, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then there's a middle page. I'll take it like this. Watch what happens to those two outer pages when I open the book. They meet here at the spine. They meet at the spine. That is unique on a pop-up book. It's critical that that happens because that's how the pages are allowed to open completely flat. So if you can see that again, they're far apart here. And as I open this to lay them flat, the left and the right come together and touch or meet very, very closely. And that lays down really flat. That is why the spine and the hinges and everything are designed the way they are for a pop-up book in a unique way because of allowing this wide stuff to close to zero. Okay, so now I'm going to get my mat board <clears throat> and show you that it's big enough for a hard cover here, a spine, and another part of a hard cover. And I've got to determine the dimensions of this mat board to make the cover. So on books, typically, you have uh, the cover being bigger than the pages. And the amount that is bigger is up to you, but the idea behind it is that it protects the pages from damage and also makes it nice and clean looking and finished as a, as a book. So right here, I've got about three or four, about maybe, maybe even five centimeters or about a quarter of an inch, roughly, here, a gap that goes all the way around. Actually, it's not, it's a lot bigger over here and uh, not as big over there, but that's about a, a quarter of an inch or maybe four, five or six millimeters. On this book, you can see that it's smaller. It's, that is probably about three millimeters or about an eighth of an inch, approximately. Same with the edges all the way around. Okay, so what it does do, though, is protect the pages. You can see that there is a gap. If I would have set this down there, there's a gap before it touches the pages, and that is important for protecting everything. In snow days, the same thing applies. It's kind of in between. That's about 3 16 probably, maybe. That's probably 4 millimeters. So, um, it isn't critical that it's a specific measurement, but it just has to give space to protect the pages. All right, so I can measure this and come up with a number, but I don't have to. What I can do instead is lay this down and move it up to the corner to visually determine what I would like to have as a gap. And you can see there's a gap right here and there's a gap right there. And I like that gap. That looks perfectly fine to me. And by eye, I could just put a pencil mark or a pen mark over here and make it have the same amount of a border. It could just be by eye. On the other hand, I could measure it. So right here I have a ruler. The ruler can go in, it goes in inches and centimeters, so I can show both. 
Right now, this goes to eight and a half inches, or if it's in centimeters, it goes to 21 and uh, uh, 21 centimeters or 200 and this is why I do inches, <laughs> 215, 16, 217 millimeters. Okay. And the gap that I'm putting in there is about four millimeters or approximately three sixteenths of an inch. It's just by eye. I like the look of that. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to check it one more time. I'm going to look at it carefully. I like the border there. I come over on this side and I make a mark that feels about the same. Okay, so what I made is a pen mark and you can see that here. That pen mark is the dimension that I need. Now, what I've got to do is cut this off like this. I cut a line across here that's parallel all the way across so I end up with a, a cover, a spine, and the back cover all the same height. And that would be accommodating the width of the page plus extra on the top and bottom of the page. Or it's the left and right in my fingers. So I can use a ruler for that, but I don't like always using a ruler when you don't have to because you might mistake a number. So instead I'm gonna do what I call a story pull. I'm just gonna take this piece of paper that is laying around, gonna be a better part that flew on it. Take this off, just use a strip of it, and use it as a story pole. So a story pole is where you can use this paper to make repeated marks, and you'll see how easy this is to do. <clears throat> so this is the mark that I have to repeat, and this is the edge of the, the mat board. I'm going to put a pen mark saying that's the edge of the mat board. Then I put another pen mark where I've made the pen mark on the mat board, and this is a story pole. It's exact no matter where I put it. I just simply have to line up this edge over here and then mark it over here. And I can repeat this on multiple pages, and I never have a mistake in getting the exact same measurement. So now I've got a mark at the top here and a mark at the bottom, and I can cut this. So I'm going to use a cork-backed straight edge because it won't slide around very easily. And I'm also going to use a, an X-Acto knife to cut this. So I'm putting the, the blade on the mark that I made over here, and then I'm going to line up the ruler, let it pivot on the blade, line it up to the one on the other end, and make a series of cuts. Now, in order not to cause damage or get out of alignment, I'm only going to scratch lightly. I don't want to slice my finger either. So I just make several passes until I'm all the way through. I feel that I'm getting close to through. In some parts of it, it is through. It would be helpful if I replaced the blade, too. There. Now I believe I've got it just about. Yeah, okay. So it's all the way through. You can see, you can tell that there's little fibers and things on the end of this. That's because the blade is a little too dull. But overall, I got a pretty clean cut on there. So this should be my page height, and you can see that if I lay this down, it's got the right border here, and it's got the right border over there. Okay, so this piece, now I can cut this into strips and use it as a glue spreader if I wanted to. Okay, so the second part of uh, the, the mat board sizing is that I have to make it the right width, or uh, the depth of my page. I've got to determine that now, and that is a critical measurement. This wasn't as critical. This one becomes critical. So let me just show you how this is working here. There's a formula that, that uh, we've derived for how to do this properly um, so that your book will do what you expect it to do and open up properly. Now, what's happening is that you have to, like I've said before, you have to have a hinge here, and that hinge is a flexible material that allows for the, the page to, to pivot 
or the, the cover to pivot, and it has to be able to tuck in behind the pages. And you can see that that's what happens when I do this. The hinges move and are flexible and allow this to lay flat. Okay, so what is the measurement that it, we're doing here? Well, this method works, and I suggest you do it. The hinge on this side and the hinge on that side are equal to each other. And they also, as a cumulative number, if I add both of those up, they add up to the same as the space in between. So in other words, get my hand out of the way, this is measurement one. Call it unit one. This is unit two and three, and this is unit four. Another way to put it is, this is one-fourth of the space, this is two-fourths of the space, this is one-fourth of the space. So one last time, there are four units here. Unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four. And that you determine by having a, uh, a stack put together for your book, determine what your spine is going to be based on all of your pages, plus the front and the back covers put on top, that determines your spine. The hinge flexibility has to be one-fourth of the spine length. And then that will allow the pages to tuck in all the way and lay flat. You have to accommodate in this, uh, the hinges not be made out of a perfect material so that, in other words, this is made out of a thickness and a stiffness, so you can't have it exactly, absolutely one-fourth and expect it to open up perfectly until it gets loose and worked a bit. Secondly, the mat board, in this case I made a gigantic cover, but this material has a thickness to it as well. Now, in the real material, like I said before, this is about a sixteenth of an inch thick, or approximately one and a third or one and a half millimeters thick. So that means that two of these are going to be one in the front, one in the back cover. That's about an eighth of an inch, or about three millimeters of thickness that has to be accommodated. So that has to be added in. You have to add in to the thickness of this material for the for how high this hinge material has to be. So I'm going to write some stuff down on here, or write down on a piece of paper so we can see. I'm going to get a clean piece. Right on. And let's see, as I'm going, I'm going to make some notes over here, just so you can see what's going on. I have my pages, and I'm not going to squish them flat because remember this is supposed to represent a pop-up book that has bulk to it, so I'm going to let it be at this natural sort of springy thickness here. I've got, I've got a cover material, and I need to also have the front of the cover material. And since I have a scrap here, I'm just going to set it down on top of here. So what I'm building up is a stack. I've got the back cover, the pages, and what we'd call the front, but I haven't cut it out yet. But it all makes up a bulk, a height. And if I can tip it up, you can see what I'm talking about. It makes up that much thickness for all of it together. So I've got to make a spine that is that height. Okay. So I can measure it with a ruler, but I can also just use a story pole to do it. So. I'm going to take a scrap of paper that's got a nice flat edge on it, put it right up against here, and then make a mark on it with a pencil or a pen, loosely marking it. And I made that mark. It's a light mark, but that mark is how high the spine has to be. I'm going to move it around and it looks really good. I'm going to mark it a little bit more visibly. That is my spine width. I'm going to check it again just to be sure. Okay, so when I've taken the all the pages and their springiness, I've taken a front and a back cover thickness. That's what I need. Okay. Now, 
I'm going to cut the spine in a minute, but I have to also figure out what is the total height of this. Well, I've got the number here, so I'm going to measure it. And this time I'll do it in millimeters and inches so we can do a comparison between the two. Okay, in inches, that's uh, 11 sixteenths. Writing upside down is going to be a little tricky. 11 and 11, that's, see, I'm writing upside down, but I can't do it. 11 16. Okay, and in millimeters, it comes to 15, 16, 17, 18 millimeters. Okay, so I can either use 18 millimeters or I could use 11 sixteenths to figure out how, what spine size is, but also to do the calculation necessary for being able to make the hinges move properly. So here's a way to look at it. At 18 millimeters, I need to say, here is my spine. And when the hinge goes on, it goes in one fourth of that and on each side and forms, this is the cover coming around onto this half of the cover and that half of the cover. I've made up one unit, two units, three units. Am I right? Nope. Yeah. It's upside down, so. Okay, three and four. Now, how do I write a four upside down? I'm not sure if that's backwards. <laughs> okay, but we got one, two, three, four across here. Okay, one unit here, two units, and three and four units. So in other words, this is a two unit gap here. So I've got to take 18 and divide it by four. So 18 and half is nine, and half of that is four and a half. So I'm gonna write down four and a half. Let me see. I'll do it the other way. <laughs> and turn it around. Uh, uh, divided by four equals 4.5 millimeters. Okay, so 4.5 millimeters is how much of a, a, a hinginess that I need on here. So I'm gonna be making that. But I can also go with 11 sixteenths and divide that by four. Now, it's a lot easier if I change it to 4 sixteenths. I'm mean, sorry, uh, 12 sixteenths instead. That would make it 3 quarters. So 12 divided by 4 is 3 uh, sixteenths. So I could go with 3 sixteenths or I can go with 4.5 millimeters. All right. That's a lot of craziness. It's a lot of math, but it's the real math that needs to be done in order for this thing to work properly. Now, this is the minimum. That's the minimum amount of flexibility you'd want to put in here. You can always put more flexibility. The difference is you make a book that is floppy, but at least it opens up all the way. If you make it less than this, your book's not going to open all the way. It's going to go like this and stop and not lay all the way flat. Okay, so what I'm going to do is write on this, write on the spine side of the book, I'm going to write a mark or draw a mark here that is four and a half millimeters. And you know what? I can call it five. Five will work perfectly well, which is good because these measurements are so fine. I need new glasses to read them anyway. So I'm going to put a mark at five millimeters here. That mark right there represents how much of a, of a gap I'm going to have here. It represents what's going on here. It represents this un covered section right there and it represents the uncovered section that's in here. There's a little section right up here that is uh, just not getting glued on and it's on every one of these books it's the same way. There's where the hinge is flexing. Okay so now I can take that. I don't need to, I, in fact I don't even need to write any numbers down now. I can actually use this marking here to make determinations of how big my cover is going to be. 
All right, so, so I'm just gonna reiterate what I did here. What I need to do is be able to have uh, the pages open completely flat when at first they are far apart. They need to go until they touch. That means that I need to have a hinge that allows for the pages, the, the, the covers to flex inward via the hinge. And they need to flex in one fourth of the way on the left and the right. So there's one fourth on this side, two fourths in the middle, and one fourth on that side. I measured the height of everything, including the covers, to be 18 millimeters, or 11 sixteenths. I divided it into quarters and came up with four and a half millimeters, but that could just as easily be five millimeters, so I can read it better so I can see it. Okay, so now that mark is going to be determining how big I make my cover, how wide it's gonna be. So I'm gonna move this out of the way because we've gotten that step done. Get some things out of the way. And now I'm back to laying out how big this cover needs to be. So here goes. I know that when I laid this down before, I wanted to have about that much of a gap. I wanted to have it even around all the way and leave about visually about that much of a gap. I'll bring it up closer, you can see. I needed that kind of gap there. The cover you can see in that corner and that corner. Okay, so my pen mark is where I will cut the mat board. So I'm just gonna look at this from the top, make sure it looks like it lines up good, and it does. So I'm gonna take my pen and make a mark on the mat, transferring straight from the, the line I drew there down onto the mat board, and I've got a mark. It's a faint mark, but it is there. You can see it right there. And I'll make a story pole again, which will allow me to transfer that to the other side and get a nice parallel mark. Okay, so lining up to the outside edge of the mat board here, and with a pen mark that I did before, and get that transfer point. Go to the other side, and transfer it. Okay, so I'm gonna use this, my cork backed ruler again and cut through this. I have to do this twice because I need a front and a back cover. So it's handy that I have that story pole because I can just use it again. I can hear for sure that my, my knife is rather dull. Okay, but I've got one. Now, I could just lay this down here and then mark it again, but I would rather just use this because I can make sure that I'm really getting it right. One of the problems with laying something down and marking it is that um, the pen and all things are made with a rather round, you can see how big and round the tip of that pen is and pencils are and everything else. It doesn't really go and draw exactly on the edge of a ruler or anything. So I would be able to use it uh, with a knife and score maybe the paper there, but I couldn't use a pen and mark exactly that way. But I can get a much more accurate alignment with this story pole. So I can now cut that. And I will have the front and back covers to size. are the same. Perfect. Okay, so you can see that they are going to be the proper size here. I'm going to lay one here. Get it dark. You can see that if I didn't know better I would think I made a mistake because if I let it have the overlap it needs on the outside it's overlapping a big white space back here which is critical because that's that's where the hinge goes. So I have my front and back cover and now I could just determine my uh, 
check if my spine stuff is still correct, which it should be. I'll find my little marking that I already did. And that looks great there. It looks great there. Remember, I'm leaving it springier than it needs to be normally because there aren't any mechanisms inside of here, but there would be if it was a pop-up. Okay, so now I've got to make my spine be that size. Set this aside. Use this as a story pole, and I just want to get an accurate line, so I trimmed it off so I can see the edge really cleanly. And put this right there and mark this. Now, some books in my collection have spines that are ridiculously oversized and some that are ridiculously undersized and they don't look right. They look wrong on the, the book and they look like they just look sloppy or poorly designed. So to do a good one, you really want it to match the actual size of your pages. So it's not a one size fits all type of thing. Now there are, I have two books in my collection by the same artist, Chuck Murphy, that made pop-up surprises, uh, color surprises, and uh, the, the numbers book, one through 10. And both of those books are like in a set. So they are the same width, same number of pages, same format, everything, and it's really cool. So you, you build up a collection and they all fit together nicely. That's a different situation where everything has to be designed so that they match. Okay, so now let's see what we've got. I've got the front and back cover. I've got the pages. I've got the spine. And you can see that the spine matches the height of, or the, the total height here. And also it makes up the, the thickness of all of this together. All right. So now, what's gonna happen when I'm laying this stuff out? is that I'm going to have my spine, and I can leave it dark or light, but I, I'm trying to contrast against the pages so I show it dark, but in the case of showing you easily on the screen, I'm gonna show you that on the white side. It doesn't matter which side is facing out or in because it all gets covered by either the cover material or by the pages themselves. Okay, so as a spine is laid out, I've got to have a gap to where the cover material is on both the left and the right side. And so I've got to determine that gap, and that gap is made up by the uh, four and a half or five millimeters that I was working from when I worked out my hinge material. So I've got to have a four and a half or five inch or five millimeter gap here and here. So how do I make sure that I've really got that gap? I'm gonna set that aside, and I'm going to take a piece of mat board here and I'm going to cut it to four and a half or five millimeters. And I'm just going to do five because that's all, that's all I can see. And um, what I'm going to do is cut a strip that's long enough that I can actually cut it into little pieces and you'll see what I'm doing here. But I'm going to cut a long strip at five millimeters and I need my pencil and mark five millimeters right there. And do it down here too. Okay, five millimeters. All right, so I've got to cut this off, cut this strip. And I'm cutting it long because I can then slice it into four pieces. And the four pieces allow me to space that stuff out and I can easily tell what is a spacer and what is the actual cover, etc. This way, plus I'm not wasting a lot of material. There, I got my five millimeter strip. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut this into quarters. So now let's take a look at this. I take one of them and lay it down here, put it up there, put it up there. And then I could put my spine in here, and then I can put the next one up, and the next one, 
and we put the cover there. That's the width that I need this to be. Of course, these all have to be in alignment, so I can take a piece of mat board or a ruler or something and make sure everything lines up nicely. Oops. Like that. Okay, so this is what my cover material has to be plus extra to be able to put the cover material up and over all of this. Now, what's going to happen is that uh, this is going to eventually hinge over and land, land about there. And the other one's going to hinge over and land about there. And they close up. Okay, so I'm going to be making the, the cover out of the brown pellac material. And you can see on this side, it's a matte paper kind of quality to it. On the other side, it's that shiny material with the lizard pattern, as they call it. And it is a latex material that's infused on it. Okay, so I'm going to move everything out of the way. Clean up the page a little bit. And this Pellac material is springy and it always is rolled up like this. So I found that it's easier to take it, roll it up the other way first to undo some, some of the stress on it. Get it. Rolled up that way and roll it up again. It helps just lay it out better. So now when it lays down, it's much flatter than it was before. And I want this side to be visible. Okay, so I think I might have enough material that I can make an efficient use of this by not, not putting it this way and wasting all of the, the skin. I could probably make another book out of the same cover material. I have enough of it. So I'm going to try it laid this way and see if it comes out the way I expect it to. Put these little spacers in here. Put that on there, put this on here, and finally the last one here. Yep, I got enough material to be able to make an entire cover up here and then another one over here, so I'm not going to waste the material. All right, so how much do I have, how much do I need overlapping around this whole thing? Well, for the gluing stage of this, it's a good idea to have extra you know, an inch or maybe, you know, uh, 25, 24, 23 millimeters, something like that, just extra material that you don't have trimmed perfectly because you can glue it down without having to have it be absolutely precision. All right, so I'm just gonna cut this off by eye and leave extra material. Now, what I'm saying about the amount of extra material, and I don't even have to have a ruler going now, about the extra material is that I need to have enough of this skin or the uh, pellac to overlap the edge of my mat board. Remember this mat board is about one and a half millimeters or about a sixteenth of an inch. So the material has to wrap up over that and then on top of the page and, or on the cover, pardon me. And then the page overlaps it and makes it disappear. So let's look at how it looks in one of these professional glasses. I'll, look, I'll show you on my blank page because it's easier to see. On my blank page, you can see in a shadow here that there is the page glued on top of the cover, hiding everything. And you can see underneath it, this little edge of the pellac. And you can see that's also the case everywhere around, a little shadow right here. The pellac material goes beyond what the page has to do. It's the case down at the bottom, too. It's on every book. So you can see it on this one. If you're careful, you can see it on every book. Let me see if I can get the lighting right. This one is harder to see. I have to maybe feel it. Yeah, you can see just the slightest edge. Or maybe you can't see it, but I can feel a little bit of an edge right there. That is the overlap as well. So you don't have to have it overlap a lot. You just have to make sure that it absolutely overlaps enough beyond what the page will do when it's on here. And I wanted about an eighth of an inch, roughly around here, or three sixteenths. And so it has to at least go beyond that 
so it has to go at a minimum a quarter inch but I would make it a half inch just to be safe you know maybe a couple centimeters okay so I'm gonna now glue this down and adhere, adhere it really well to the cover material so I can start with one of these I need to have it roughly centered here and I need to make sure they're all lined up really nicely but I'm gonna do that as I go so I'm gonna start by gluing one of them down so I can take everything else away this is where I want this to go and so just to be safe I'm gonna mark it with a pen so I know at least roughly where I'm going and you may not be able to see those marks but I can see that there's marks here and here they're invisible for you but they are something I can see so that later on I can place this right in that spot set it down and then it's good to go everything else will be built on it so I have a very large area that has to be glued and I can choose any of the various gluing materials that I want in order to do this. I could use the, the Linko, I can use the Yes Paste, and I can use the Elmer's Glue All. If it was the Elmer's Glue All, one thing you have to worry about is that you've got to be quick about it because it's such a big area. Um, the Yes Paste is, I think it it's just spreads fast because it's a, a big spreader. So I'm going to use that for now. I've used Glue All for everything else. This book was completely 100% glue all for everything so it works absolutely now this one was not any of the glues we're talking about I had to use a weird special glue called Rue glue um, it's it's a vinyl adhesive and that's because you can't glue rigid foam with Elmer's glue easily so it does bond with this uh, special glue called Rue glue non-toxic, washable with water, but it bonds uh, non-porous materials together. It can bond metal to glass to cork. It can do porous and non-porous materials and it's non-toxic. Okay, so I'm going to scoop some Yes Paste out, way more than I need, and spread it around. Set that off. Now, I'm leaving this cover here because I need something to uh, to work again so I can tell what I'm doing, but also if, it is, if it's messy, it's not such a big deal because this is gonna all be glued eventually. All right, so I'm putting Yes Paste on here and I'm gonna use a spreader to get it out and go evenly all over the whole thing. And I don't want a hugely thick layer. It doesn't have to be too thick. It just has to still be uh, fluid. I wouldn't exactly call the stuff wet. <laughs> um, I can see it sort of set, you know, drying a little bit though. So I've got to be quicker. But if I was using glue all, um, you have to be quick about that too. Okay, I have a very thick coat. I'm going to get some of this off of here. It's really important that you get up to all of the edges. Oops, uh-oh. Because if you don't, you end up with a problem in uh, your cover starting to peel off. Okay, that is really disgustingly sticky and covered. Next time, I would use something other than my cover material as a, as a spreader backdrop. I'm gonna clean some of this off. I'll leave that. Icky, 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 sticky. Okay, so I've gotta get this adhered, ooh boy. Boy, oh boy, I'm gonna take some of this off. Yeah, yes, paste is archival and all, and it's made for spreading, but I still like my Elmer's glue. Okay, get this on here. Make sure it's approximately lined up there, and press it down. going to take some of this excess uh, spread it out just so it's not sticky everywhere and like I said before I'm going to be using all of this it's going to all be glued eventually so it's not such a big deal okay so I've got to get this spread out nicely so I'm going to just make sure it's rubbed down really well everywhere and then I'm going to flip it over 
and do the same on the other side. Yeah, I'm gonna do Elmer's, or actually the Linko, because I have a lot of that. I'm gonna use that for the next part. So you can see on this side that it's pretty flat. Looks like it's going down nicely. It didn't curl the paper too much. It's laid down pretty good. Okay. Now, you know what? Because I have so much yes paste, I'm going to put the spine on with that because I've already got it gooey and messy here anyway. So I'm going to set these two spacers here. There. And there. And, ooh, boy, gooey stuff. Put some of this stuff on here. And like I said before, I could use something else as a spreader. I don't have to use this. So I'm going to take a piece of mat board and use it to, to finish up the spread, spreading business. I don't need it very big. In fact, it's better if it's a little small in this case. Okay. Spread this stuff on here. I guess I could say that someone could say, is this sticky? I say, yes, it is sticky. Make sure it's on everything though. I can see areas that are sort of turning dull and those are the areas that I wanna make sure I'm making sure it's spread down on before I move on, before I adhere it. I'm not going to have a lot of time. If this was a double-sided tape, it would be impossible, but I have time at least to make sure that I'm getting these things in alignment with each other with the bottom, and then the top will automatically be aligned. So I press that real firmly, and it should be in place. I can remove these two spacers now because that's right where it needs to be. Slippery. Pressing it down, make sure it's joined. Okay, so I'm going to use these spacers again. And glue this last section down. Okay, just to show you the difference, I'm going to use the other kind of glue and see how that works out. I need something to glue this against, you know, spread it on there. It's not big enough. A spare piece of something that can protect the table. That's not big enough either. Okay, nice big thing. Put glue all over this, spread it around. Now, I'm going to make a mat board spreader that's a little bit bigger because I'm applying it to a bigger area, but also just show you that this is a great way to make a spreader. Okay, I'm going to spread glue all over this. I'm also going to clean up some extra yes. stuff is pretty sticky. I actually like it. Big area. I may decide to add more. Depends on how well I spread it out. 
like with all these glues, if um, you have too much, you can just spread it off on a scrap piece. And if you don't have enough, you can add it. And if you wait too long, you can always just add more on top of that. So maybe I don't need more. Just wipe the excess off. Make sure I'm really getting it evenly everywhere. I'm going to go up against the edges. It is twice as runny at least compared to Elmer's glue. So out of the viscosity ranges of these things, yes, paste is the most, well, actually, the double-sided tape is the most viscous. It doesn't want to flow, but it certainly is uh, movable, stretchable. Um, then you, the yes paste is literally a paste that will hold itself in shape. And then the Elmer's glue is stickier. And then eventually you get to the Linco, which is runny. Take a little bit of the excess. I have time to get it on here while it's still wet, but not a lot more time. If it was hot out, you'd be already panicked about this. So weather does have an effect on it. How humid it is or how dry it is and how warm it is. Also how much of a breeze you have around too. So what I have for weather is it's a little cool and it's also not breezy at all in here. And it's not humid either, although it did rain today. Okay, so I've got it fairly even around there. A few little spots that are a little bit thicker than others, but that's okay. And it's warping the paper just to, or the mat board a little bit because it's so wet. But I'm going to get that on there and I have some time to align it. Make sure that it's even at the bottom. Take these little spacers out. And spread that down, you know, rub it down good. Wow, it's bonding nicely. Okay. If you find that it is not bound down well in every corner and every edge, you're going to need to put glue under it before you get to the next stage. Otherwise, you'll form bubbles or uneven edges. You can see on my cover here, it's really quite flat. There's no air bubbles anywhere in it. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over. It's not sticky, so it shouldn't stick to my, my board here, but I can really press this down, make sure it really is nicely adhered. It looks great from here on all of that. So you can see that Yes Paste works, um, Linco works, Elmer's works. I didn't do double-sided adhesive for this because I'd have to cover the entire thing, which would be quite ridiculous. Otherwise, you would definitely have a bubble showing. So let's see how they behave differently between these, if you can tell um, whether they have a bow to them. They both seem to have a, a bow in the material from being wet. This is, this is, the, um, this is the Yes Paste, one, and this is the Linko. And it looks like I have a little spot right here where I have to add a little bit of glue in. You can see it's not completely, let's see if you can tell in the video. You can see that there's a little gap forming right here, but it's not sticking. So I need to shove more material in there and press it down well. So the way to do it is to take a piece of paper Put some glue on it. Like glue is on there. And shove it in there and press down on this to deposit glue wherever it's necessary. So the yes paste definitely adhered 
faster than the Linco. So I'm going to hold both edges down, make sure they're really bonding nicely. Wipe off the excess glue. Press that. You can't really skimp on this process, otherwise you're going to have stuff that just doesn't look good. You can always weight this down with something, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, so my next stage is that I have to be folding all of these on here and finish the covering material, finish that up. And so in order to finish it up, I've got to do some uh, trimming of this and make it look nice and neat. So here's what I'm gonna figure out. You notice that this can lay down and cover right across here. And it doesn't need to be as big as it is. Now, if I zoom in on my gigantic sample here, what you're going to see is that the cover material goes up and over the spine, but it also, um, on the front here, goes up and over the cover. Now, this is only, this is a half a, an inch or, you know, six or 12 millimeters approximately, but on here, it's one and a half millimeters or about uh, one sixteenth of an inch. That may seem trivial, but you have to make sure that the material is wrapped up over the edge and then down again. And I'm going to do that. So what I need to do is make a little notch in here. And I'll do a drawing on my uh, paper that I had for sketching here. Show you the detail of what I'm talking about. So here is my cover board. That's the, that's the front board. Here is my cover material. That's the uh, Pellac material that's back there. What I need to do is trim this straight up and then angle it back. Trim it straight up and then angle it back. And what I'm going to do is that little straight up section is what will roll up over the thickness of the mat board. And then this angled back will allow me to lay this down and go towards the center of the page. This one will also do the same and lay on top. So you see that all of this is going to be cut away. So if I look at it as a whole, it's like this. Here is that's called at the front of the cover, the spine, the back cover, Pellac material, it's going to be shaped like this. Cut up, back, across, back, cut up. Up, back, across, back. Mess that one up. And the amount that you do is, of course, related to the uh, thickness of the mat board. It has to overlap it. But also, this angle, it shouldn't be a 45. If it was a 45, you're going to end up folding them exactly like this. You need stuff to overlap each other. So make it less than... I'll show you what a 45 looks like and compare it. So here's a corner, and this is a 45, like that. So I would cut it back a little bit here and there, not at a 45, because then they will overlap each other. So why is there an angle at all, though? <clears throat> That's because you may not be able to see it in this if I get really close. It's because, uh, let's see if you can see the shine. You can see down here, right there, that little angle. That makes it so that you have a really clean edge with this wrapping around and the one that's glued from the bottom not interfering with the edge. And so it's angled ever so slightly there. And that you'll find in every book. Let's see if we can see it in this one. This one is very fine. You can almost not see it. 
In fact, I may not be able to show it to you at all, but you can kind of see an angled part in this corner right here. Okay, so I'm going to cut this out. I don't have to measure it. I can just simply do this by eye. So what I'm going to do is cut this carefully. I'm going to go right at the edge of the mat board and go up a little more than a sixteenth of an inch, then angle it across. And I'll go up a little more than a sixteenth so it wraps around and then angle this across and take this piece out. So it's got those straight cuts. As you can see if I get my hand back there, you can see the straight cuts and then the angled cuts. Do the same for this side. Straight up, angle back. Straight up, angle back. Get to the fourth one. Straight up, angle back. Up, back. One more. Up, back. And up, back. Okay, so I've got all of my edges ready to be bent over, but they're ridiculously uneven and all that. So I need to consider how far I really want those to go. So I know for sure that I have to, when I, when I have my page here, page is all installed, I need about that much of a gap here on this edge. This is both sides. I need a little bit of a gap like that. So this has to go at least that far over, plus more than that. So I'm just going to take a narrow ruler, something even. As I mentioned, I have a small one somewhere around here. Buried among my piles of things. I have this, a nice narrow one. And I can lay this down here and just cut this off evenly, and that might be good. Let's see. I could also go less. Let's see what that amounts to. This cleans it up really fast. Now, I could just measure it all, too, but this sure is easy. Okay, so now I've got them nice and even. That's that's good. That goes over, goes over a nice amount. It's definitely going to be more than I need, and that's okay. Okay, so now I have to glue these down. This is an arduous process, but it's doable. So I have a choice. Do I glue the top first and then these edges? Or do I glue these edges first and then the top? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. So I'm going to glue these first because they're the big ones and I just want to. And first, before I do it, I'm going to actually get this to bend over and sort of train it to be going where I expect it to go. Then I'm going to apply glue and then press this down. And it is really best, in this case, if I used a glue that was quicker setting. it just make it easier on me. I could also use the double-sided tape for this. Um, how light is that tape? Boy, oh boy, that looks just about perfect. If I don't mess it up, this could be the trick. So I'm going to try that out. I might be regretting it. I'll use this as a backing material in case I get some. This, this isn't exactly, it's, it's wide enough here and it gets a little narrower there, but that's okay. I'm going to go for it anyway. So I'm going to put this double-sided tape here. See if I can do this. I've never used double-sided tape for this. But I'm liking what it's doing so far, I hope. Okay, so that is all sticky right there. Now I'm tugging this thing because I want to make sure it's tight. That's down. Wow, this was by far the fastest I've ever done this. That double-sided tape stuff. 
Of course, not everybody's going to have an ATG. And that's why you could just use a roll of double-sided tape. Of course, the kind that doesn't have a core of foam or anything like that. <laughs> okay, so this is adhered really well. But right here, where the hinges are, I need to make sure I just press that down in as much as I can and hold it, get it down in there, I guess. <clears throat> and I can use something to press down in there if I want to. Just use that thing. Use my bone tool. Okay, that's on there. Nice. Boy, I like that so much. I'm going to do it again. Uh-oh, I'm running off of course. Okay, I think I need to do it again here. Adding extra. Okay. Okay, so here goes. Get this trained before I bring it down. Pull it real tight everywhere. Instant adhesion. Okay. Now, because that is so awesome, I'm going to use it for all of them. Excess, a little bit of glue off. He's boy, that stuff's sticky. Okay, tug this nice and tight. <sighs> Clean up that edge. A little excess glue or adhesive. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna show you up close what it's looking like once I get it smoothed out. You can see how it has overlapped here and makes a nice cleaned up edge. On to my last one. Maybe I should glue this one just to show you how that can be done. If you don't have the fancy stuff like I do, which you won't. Okay, so I'm going to use Elmer's glue on this. Make sure there's enough. I could use my finger to spread it. I can use a spreader, so I'm just going to use my finger. Yeah, it's a spreader. Nice and even. And then make sure I'm putting this up here, tugging it like the other method. Just using my fingernail, my thumbnail, to press this down up and up against the layers. Make sure it's on there really well, which it looks like it is. You can see that the double-sided tape worked and Elmer's glue worked as well. So now I've got to, I've got to make these hinges flexible now because they have not, they're very stiff. So to make them flexible, I'm going to just start folding this thing every which way and flex up all of these and really just press hard on them and make sure everything is working in here. Get a little excess glue off here and there.
make sure every one of these hinges elements in the hinges are all flexed and move them all. This is the most difficult stage because none of it has been flexed before. You can see what I've got is that I'm able to bring these things in from the hinge on each end. You can see that moving. This, when it's in as tight as it can go, is what it ought to be at when the book is fully open. So I lay this book in here flat. I should have gaps on both sides and those gaps, oops, let me check it from my top view. Look like it's pretty good all around and it should close okay. So this is what my book's going to ultimately look like. Get this in here. Okay, so how do I make sure that I put this down in here and get it in there nice and solid and properly done? The way to do it is to adhere one side to here and then let the other side happen after you've got it, the first one down. So I've got to glue this page into about there. Leave a nice border all around. And it and then this should come up and form the cover like that. Okay. So here goes. I've got to put glue, adhesive, tape, whatever on here and then put it onto there. So this would probably make sense given that such a large surface area. Yes paste sounds like the winner to me. And uh, it's a good idea that I actually mark off where I'm not putting glue. So I'm gonna use my finger to measure along where I had put the pen mark before and do the same on the other side. I set up my finger as a gauge, just go across here quickly and that is where I don't put glue based on what I had put a pen mark on before, right over here. Okay, so I've got to put glue on all of this area, get it onto there, do one side at a time. All right. Yeah. I need to be able to spread glue all over this, so I'm going to lay my book. This is the non, this is the back of the book. These are the spreads here, so I need to lay it down onto something that allows me to spread this glue out. So this blank sheet hopefully is big enough to put glue all over this. Or yes paste. Get it right up to that edge. Spread it all the way out past everywhere. With all of the work that it takes in doing a pop-up book, you really don't want to get glue all over your artwork. So you got to make sure you're not letting stuff slide around when you're doing this process, or you'll get glue on the wrong side. Okay, so that is fully covered everywhere, and pretty even. Get this. See all the glue around there, around the edges? Get this out of the way. And now, uh, this has got to be fairly quick. I don't have a lot of time, but it's going to be by eye for this side. Now, it is a little slippery, so I can have time to put this up here and make sure that the spine is going to work. Looks like it's gonna be okay. So I 
Got to open this carefully and spread that out. And so far it looks really neat, really clean, really refined, like a real pop-up book. The amazing thing about all of this effort is, could you imagine working at a pop-up book factory where you have to assemble an entire book and then you have to bind it or someone does that job and that's their job all day, every day, a few thousand of them in a week. Okay, so that's done. In fact, what you could do is just hire them to do your whole book for you. Okay, so I've got to put Yes Paste on here too. This is a little trickier because I've got to, there, that'll do it. That'll allow me to work on it because I got it flat against this table, but I've got to find a clean piece of uh, scrap material that I can lay underneath it. And that's not big enough. A little bit of Yes Paste where it shouldn't be. Clean it off later. Okay, so I'm going to use this piece as a slip sheet. Get some more Yes Paste. Yes, indeed. I have a lot. But I don't have enough. Make sure nothing moves around. Up to the edges, going past the paper. Nice even coat. Well, one thing is absolute, you need a spreader if you're going to be using this stuff. I used a spreader when I was working with the Elmer's glue even. It's just the spreader can be just a piece of mat board. This plastic one works really, really well. Okay, evenly spread. And now, get off of this sticky piece. all working right here. Hey. It looks like it's in a good spot. Press it down firmly. I haven't closed the book yet to see if it's working, but it's working opened up flat. That's for sure. Let's see what happens if I close it because this, this yes paste still has some flexibility I can move it just a little bit here and there Let's see does the book close oh yes the book closes and it opens okay so <laughs> I better keep spreading this out yeah. it's pretty late I've been working on this for about you know two hours and it would take less time if I wasn't explaining everything and trying different glues and everything. But do give yourself several hours worth of time to do all this process, because that's what it's going to take. And got that on there nicely pressed down, looking gorgeous. And it closes well. Let's see what it does for opening. Okay, page one opens flat. Page two opens flat. So every page should work that way. You can see that as I do this, all of the, the hinge does its thing like it's supposed to. It all comes like this, flat, like that. Great, great, yes. Okay, so I have made a bound book. Now, there are no pop-ups in here, as you know, so, um, but you can see, if I look in here, there's all the springiness of each of the pages. Uh, let's see if I get the camera lined up. The pages have their springiness about them. The hinge is flexible. The book opens flat. 
it closes solidly and it's got the kind of gap that protects the artwork. All done. That's how you bind. Now the sad thing is I put all the work into this and there's no artwork in here. It's pretty sad. It's much better when there's a real pop-up.